Good afternoon and welcome to Praxis Peace Institute's Friday series on Zoom. I'm Georgia Kelly, the Director of Praxis. Today we are hosting one of the most successful environmental activists who also has a wealth of knowledge and wisdom in crafting solutions to the climate crisis. Osprey Oriel Lake is the founder and director of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, which brought together 100 global women leaders to draft and implement a women's climate action agenda. She serves on the executive committee of the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature and has been a core organizer of various international rights of nature tribunals. Her writing about climate justice, women in leadership, and other environmental topics have been featured in The Guardian, Common Dreams, Earth Island Journal, The Ecologist, and other publications. She is the author of Uprisings for the Earth, Reconnecting Culture with Nature, which won the 2011 Nautilus Book Prize. Her latest book, which we are going to talk about today, is The World is uh, the Story is in Our Bones, How Worldviews and Climate Justice Can Remake a World in Crisis. This is the book. I'm going to highly recommend you get it. I just finished it and I'm just wowed by it, quite honestly. The detail, the heart, the knowledge, the research, the combination of it all is extraordinary. So I highly recommend this. The story is in our bones. It's in our local bookstore, at Reader's Books in, in uh, Sonoma. And you can also get it on Amazon. And if you do, please leave a review. We want this book to go viral. So Osprey, welcome. It's wonderful to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Enjoying uh, being here and seeing all of you. Yes, it's wonderful. I've known Osprey for a long time when we were both artists before we were doing the work we're doing now. So before we get into the book, Osprey, I'd like to hear about your experience at the UN Climate Summit in Dubai. Being held in an oil-rich country, as will also be the case later this year when it's held in Azerbaijan, I want to know how much of the summit is being used for greenwashing. Like, what's the percentage of greenwashing versus actual policy that will help the climate crisis. So that's one question. And the second part of it, oh, excuse me, I have to. Okay, excuse me, I have to mute people that don't mute when they come in. So the second part of the question is, what is uh, the purpose and the ideas of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network in attending these summits? How are they useful to you and your group? And why do you continue to go? Hmm, great, great questions. Uh, so yes, the um, the uh, UN Climate Talks in Dubai, uh, you know, I think framing it to kind of even blend some of your questions together, I think is, is a good approach, which is that um, the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network and certainly a lot of civil society organizations and frontline groups um, are not going to the COP thinking that everything is gonna be resolved there by government. So I think that's something to sort of remove from the table because the systems in which the UN operates um, really are not necessarily the best conditions for a holistic and comprehensive approach to the climate crisis and resolving it at the level that the urgency requires. I mean, the COP in Dubai was COP 28. So 28 years later, we're still escalating the climate crisis. So that says everything about that process, if you will, in some ways. Um, that said, it's the space that we have. It's part of an ecosystem of components of things that many of us are working on. I'm sure some of you who are on this call as well, where uh, we need to recognize that the UN Climate Talks are part of the ecosystem that we need to navigate and utilize to our, our best abilities. It is the one space where all countries are meeting and having this discussion every year. And so it's extremely valuable in that way. But in terms of like our organization and I believe others as well, it's just one of the things that we do all year. Not all of our eggs certainly are in that basket. You know, we're doing so many other things on reforestation, protecting land, um, uh, uh, doing things on food sovereignty and food security, many, many other spaces of work on advocacy and projects. So I think it's important to put the COP in context that it is a space, it is territory and terrain that we need to keep pushing forward because that's where governments are meeting. In terms of the actual COP um, in Dubai, um, you know, it was extremely challenging, as you stated, it, we're in a 
you know, the presidency was led by someone who is head of a, you know, oil company in Dubai. Um, we were met with a lot of challenges there because of the government and what we were allowed to do and not do. This also happened to us in Egypt, where civil society is really being contained in the COP venue, and it's not safe or legal to protest outside of that space. So it's been really challenging the last two COPs because we have been forced to stay on the premises and not do our usual large global movement marches on the streets. So it's been a very confined space and a lot of restrictions on the kind of protests that we can have and the kind of um, the, the, the process of how civil society organizes itself has been really challenged by uh, the last two cops and also in Dubai. Um, that said, one of the main things of why we're there is that <clears throat> I believe, and I personally have a deep, uh, I guess, reaction to the fact of governments meeting without us being in the room. As they say, if you're not um, at the table, you're on the menu. And this is definitely a case where if civil society has not been participating in these cops, things would be so much worse than they already are. The government's already you know, taking us in a trajectory that is terribly dangerous with methodologies and ideologies and quote unquote solutions that are not really going to meet what we need to face in terms of really uh, changing the trajectory of the climate crisis. But it would be so much worse if we weren't there, just as a few examples, there would not be the 1.5 degree guardrail that is you know, baked into the, the Paris Climate Agreement if we were not all advocating in Paris, all of civil society with the pressure of um, climate vulnerable countries that were also advocating for this 1.5 degree guardrail. That would never have happened. And that 1.5 degree guardrail has been hugely important to the climate justice movement as we advocate since the Paris Climate Agreement that we have something to hold governments to, something to hold financial institutions to, something to hold corporations to when they say they wanna be aligned with the Paris Agreement. We can show them how they're not because of that advocacy point. Just to give like one example, um, what happened in Dubai is that because of civil society and again, climate vulnerable countries, we were able to force a conversation that was never meant to happen in Dubai, which is the phase out of fossil fuels. <clears throat> that was forced into the discussion on the global stock take, which happened this year and ended up having to be a core principle that governments had to deal with because of the insistence of all the demonstrations, the pressure of the constituencies um, that are from civil society. So. You know, on the on the big scale, people are like, oh, the next cop failed. I mean, they're all going to fail probably at the context that we want them to. But there's all these other um, moving parts that are going on where civil society is pushing the agenda, uh, demanding climate justice. In Egypt, the year before, we won on loss and damage. That there's now a loss and damage fund, which is a form of demonstrating that we need climate justice. That countries who are most vulnerable, who have done the least to contribute to the climate crisis needs support from the loss and damage that they will experience because of wealthy countries. That fund has been fought for for 30 years and we finally won on that. Yes, there's all kinds of problems and loopholes in it, but these are significant markers that are pushing governments in a direction that they wouldn't normally go. Um, and there is a huge amount of fossil fuel influence as you were mentioning, um, uh, Georgia, you know, this this particular COP had 2,400 around fossil fuel lobbyists, double almost from last year. It's absolutely insane. And a lot of the civil society constituencies are trying to figure out how to intervene with the UNFCCC to demand that there be a change in their policies about allowing all these, you know, polluters, if you will, into these negotiations. Um, we do know that the um, OPEC right in the middle of the negotiations as fossil fuel phase out started to become a rumbling, uh, went and reached out to you know, governments and said, you know, don't go along with the fossil fuel phase out. Don't mention that. We don't want that stay focused on carbon emission reductions. So there was that direct influence um, of the fossil fuel industry. Um, so yeah, it was, it was challenging that way, but we did walk away with governments agreeing to um, transitioning off of fossil fuels in the energy sector. You know, 
it's not the language we wanted. They should make a clear plan for a phase out, but they we did achieve them finally talking about fossil fuels and knowing that they have to transition off of it and we'll have to build on that quote unquote victory, which it was, but you know, we need so much more to happen. Um, so the other thing, the last thing I'll say and hand it back to you is that, um, you know, I think we can't also underestimate what it means if you have a very clear objective to be at the COP where you have access. And there's so much going on be, in addition to the formal negotiations, which we can is very engaged in like the Just Transition Work Program, uh, the Gender Action Plan. There's things that we're very specifically tracking and have for years and push negotiators in the different rooms to do different things. But there's a lot going on, quote unquote, on the sidelines where you know indigenous peoples from all over the world are there. Uh, there's meetings with negotiators, there's opportunities to be right in the face of, you know, the highest levels of government. The space is open, not that you have instant access, but, you know, you can walk up to John Kerry and make a demand. He's there, standing there. And, you know, there's many opportunities with the delegations we bring of frontline, uh, primarily indigenous women, to directly talk to their uh, country leads, to be able to be heard in different spaces. We have um, many different events, uh, pavilion events, we have press conferences. So the intervention of what we're doing in that space is highly significant and that's the value in going. And it's not gonna be you know, paraded around in some flashy way. It's a lot of grinding, difficult behind the scenes work but it's also a way that civil society is building power together because we do all of these events and we learn from each other and we push each other's agendas and language and ideologies. And there was uh, an opportunity to have civil society protest um, and demand for a ceasefire. And you know, people were like, what are you gonna do about Palestine and Gaza when you're there? And there is protest every day for ceasefire at the highest levels of governments right there in that space. So. I would just say that it's definitely not for everyone, but if you have a specific agenda and you're tied into you know, certain goals, um, it, it ends up being a space that it can be quite valuable. All right, that's definitely a good explanation of why you're there every year. And I wanna just ask, a, I just want a quick answer to this one because I wanna go into something then with your book. Do you think that a new kind of international organization may be something like a People's Climate Summit should actually start being put together because the UN summit on one level is not getting the job done. I understand that you and other uh, NGOs are getting a lot done, but the actual summit itself isn't. Do you think there's a place for a, a people's type of summit or an international people's organization that will take on climate at a really uh, systemic level? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's something that is discussed Annually, mm -hmm. uh, there has been attempts by different groups to like, let's boycott the COP and create our own global climate context movement, um, you know, meeting some kind of convener convergence. And it's not that those have not happened and they continue to happen. And I totally support that and think that needs to happen. Um, I think one of the most successful is when Bolivia held a conference right after a failed climate talks that was probably the most successful uh, in uh, 20, when was that, 2010, the early part of 2010. Um, but uh, but the only caution I have what I've seen is not that, that we shouldn't do it, but we have to figure out how to bring enough momentum because what happens is the reason that the UN climate talks gets so much attention and people go is because the government leaders are there and that's who we want to appeal to and push decisions upon. And so when I've seen some of these other um, configurations and formations, they end up not being as big or getting enough press or getting enough momentum. So I, I think they're important, but I think we have to see them sort of more, uh, you know, a collection of different convenings that would happen that maybe collectively together could create enough push and force um, because, um, yeah, people tend to want to meet where where they feel like they're going to have their impact. But I'm not against there being, you know, another type of convening. But I think it would have to be sort of a collective one in different countries simultaneously. 
Right, get it. Um, now I want to go to your book, because throughout your book, you make it very clear that capitalism as a dominator system can only view nature as something to be used, not a living system that we need to collaborate with. So I'd like you to talk about the problem of capitalism and implementing solutions to the climate crisis and what you see as a possible remedy. Well, it's such a, a huge, huge topic. Um, and I see David Corton on this call who probably could answer this very succinctly um, and hopefully we'll come to the conversation on that since he's an expert on this topic. Um, but, uh, you know, um, I think we need to see it in context. And this is really what I'm talking about with the systemic change. So I'd like to just broaden a little bit around capitalism because I really get into this topic in my book of these interlocking systems of oppression, capitalism being one of them, you know, looking at economic, uh, endless economic growth models or an extractive economy, which capitalism is, but exactly how that is intertwined with colonization and how that is intertwined with patriarchy and how that is intertwined with racism. And I think it's very important if we're gonna talk about climate justice or solutions to climate, that we have this larger framing because if we're really going to get at the root causes of the climate crisis, environmental degradation, and what many scholars are calling you know, a poly crisis, which also includes colonization and racism and misogyny, we begin to see these patterns of uh, looking at root causes and then have the capacity to hold a systemic change big enough to address those interlocking crises because it's hard to tug on one of them without tugging on the other. So we really can't have you know, the system of endless economic growth in capitalism if we didn't also have colonization, if we didn't also have racism. We, they, they feed each other because capitalism depends on having places to extract from the land, places to practice endless economic growth and extraction, which means there have to be sacrifice lands where that can take place, which is mostly indigenous black and brown communities away out there somewhere, a white from, away from white wealthy people. And so um, we need to understand how they feed one another and the whole idea also of colonization and how capitalism and colonization are very intertwined in the sense of having land that you can colonize and people that you can colonize to then generate capitalism from that model. Um, tied into all of this is gender inequality and the fact that you know we live in a very hyper-masculinized world right now that's very out of balance. And one of the things that perpetuates colonization, capitalism, and racism is also gender inequality and the fact that we don't live in governance structures that honor female and male leadership or gender diverse leadership for that matter in any regard, which also then creates these systems of hierarchy. And you know, this is why I got into the topic of worldviews in my book, because I wanted to really go upstream and say, okay, what are the root causes of these systems of oppression that we've been talking about and where do these belief systems come from and worldviews that, that perpetuate capitalism, racism, colonization and patriarchy. And so this is like, again, looking at these dominator views, this view that we have dominion over nature, men have dominion over women, uh, there's white supremacy, white people over people of color or indigenous peoples. Um, and the this view of dominion over and these hierarchies are completely at the root cause of how we got into the climate crisis. So we have to really unpack them simultaneously and understand at the root, we need a very different relationship with nature and one another. And part of that is dismantling capitalism and colonization. Part of it is saying and inviting, how do we have a different economic framework that is not based on um, endless economic growth models or views uh, nature as something for us to use as our slave and to abuse over and over again. When we see the world as nature being animate, that we're relatives, that we're part of the web of life, that worldview completely changes our relationship to our economy, which would not allow for capitalism because we don't um, destroy our relative. We don't harm the web of life that we're part and particle of. So I think we need to sort of see this in a very holistic way and the 
the interlocking relationships between these systems of oppression that have led to the crises that we're in. Well put. I, I would love to delve into worldviews with you, but that could go on for an hour by itself. So I was very hesitant to bring that up, but I think this is one very important part of your book where you go into different worldviews and what comes out of those worldviews, what they support, what they nurture or don't nurture. And that is a very important sort of philosophical piece in your book that I really appreciated. But what I want to go to right now is um, I was quite moved up actually by your description of the treks you took into, into the wilderness and the connection with nature that you've had really all of your life, a visceral connection. And that brings me to two things. One is I, I want you to talk about some of the um, weekend projects that you've been involved in. And with that, I want to use a quote that you used in your book from a Belgian Russian chemist, uh, Ilya Brigo. Goni or something like that. Don't know how to pronounce his last name. But he says, quote, when a system is far from equilibrium, small islands of coherence have the capacity to shift the entire system, unquote. So I'd like you to talk about some of those islands because I know you've been involved in them. So tell us about some of your work in some of those islands. Yeah, great. And thanks for pulling out that quote. I really resonated with it as well because I also think it generates hope in the sense that it's so overwhelming and there is so much massive destruction going on ecologically and socially that you know how do we how do we view how change happens so it's a very profound not just theory of change but the fact that it is in science something that actually works um i think is is a really hopeful uh lens so um maybe i'll just mention a few of the projects we have that just you know have popped into mind uh when you ask the question one is um we have a project in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which we've been working on for about eight years, which with a wonderful uh, weekend coordinator, Nima Namadamu, who's a dear beloved friend. Um, and um, I met her at a big conference that weekend put on uh, some years back, and we just really had a wonderful connection. And uh, we did, through a series of trainings and a lot of listening circles, we determined that um, it would be really successful and powerful to start a reforestation project in the Atombe rainforest. And as some of you probably know, um, second to the Amazon rainforest, the Congo Basin is the most important forest we need to protect in terms of, of size and what it means to the overall ecosystems of the world. I mean, and also including, I would say, the boreal forest and the Indonesian forest. But those four forests are absolutely key. And in this one area where we're working, um, it had been through slash and burn techniques. And again, because of capitalism, colonization and mining um, in the DR Congo, just absolutely devastated. I mean, there's, you know, there's sort of uh, areas I've been to where there have been clear cuts or logging and you still see some foliage and stumps. I mean, this land was like nothing. We're just talking to the ground, nothing green. And so over the course of the last eight years, uh, there are probably about, 900 to 1,000 now women in the program. It's women-led. And they're reforesting vast areas of the Atombe rainforest. And 25% of the trees are for human use and what they need on a daily basis as indigenous peoples there. And 75% are growing back, you know, rewilding the land. And we're to the point now, which I, I didn't realize it would happen this, you know, relatively quickly in eight years, which is... Um, we've grown enough trees that a huge amount of the population is now no longer going to the old growth forest. So we're simultaneously protecting 1.6 million acres of old growth forest because now it's being left and not, you know, they're, they're using the wood, the, the forest that we've grown. So it's also become a forest protection project. And then um, we've planted enough trees that mother nature is now uh, intervening in the sense that the rains are coming back. We're cooling down the land. The rains are coming back. In the last few years, we've seen what we're calling wild nurseries in, to, in addition to the nurseries where we're um, growing saplings. All this forest is popping up because of the rains returning. And so it's just been an incredibly inspiring project to see the land coming back, reforestation taking place back. And the social component is that in this very patriarchal, violent society, these women are being empowered because you know they're the one leading the project. Um, 
some of them we fly to different regions to speak at conferences and their stature in the community has gone up. The respect for them as leaders has gone up. They're also getting income from this. So it's been just, you know, very holistic at, at many, many levels. So that's like an island of hope and coherence that we're working on. <clears throat> and then um, I would also mention, um, you know, different areas where we have food sovereignty programs where, you know, we, we are looking at how it's very likely the climate crisis, environmental degradation will increase and get worse for a while. I'm holding out and hoping that things will then get better, but there, right now there's going to be more st storms, floods, droughts. I mean, we've locked in a lot of uh, climate chaos. And so how do we create, you know, uh, and first we're looking at frontline communities. So mostly we're working with um, indigenous women leaders around um, you know, how to create food sovereignty, bring back traditional ecological knowledge, uh, create these hubs that also have emergency centers that can also be places of safe harbor um, for when there are catastrophes. So we have some projects in the Gulf South and in Oklahoma supporting indigenous leaders and in creating these hubs um, where there can be um, you know, locally grown food, local medicines, and create a lot of, you know, um, you know, sustainability, um, their own solar power, like how do we create these hubs of, of livability and um, protection and safe harbor? So we're looking at that as well. Um, and then I think the last thing I'll mention is, you know, something more that's at the advocacy level, because I consider advocacy also islands of hope and, and change, which is, um, uh, you know, we are on the executive committee of the rights of nature. And um, this is a, if you're not familiar with it, it's a form of uh, law that really sees nature as a, a, a living entity. And currently in our legal frameworks, nature is viewed as dead matter or um, property. And so we really have nature caught up into a legal framework that supports capitalism and colonization because we see nature as a commodity. And what rights of nature law does, it says, no, we need to remove nature from the marketplace. We don't want the commodification and financialization of nature. We need to see nature as the sacred life-giving entity that nature is. And so I really love this whole idea of rights of nature because it really turns the DNA of our legal systems upside down and puts mother earth in the center and ensures that the economy and our governance structures respect the natural laws of the earth, respect the planetary boundaries. And so it really is a powerful framework in that really hold this moment of how we transform both our legal frameworks around nature, but also our economy um, and lastly, I would just say that rights of nature is not just an idea. Um, in Ecuador, rights of nature um, was became part of the constitution in 2008 and cases have been won around rights of nature laws in Ecuador. In the United States, there's been over three dozen um, local ordinances to prac, uh, stop fracking in communities or harmful projects from coming into a community asserting rights of nature laws. Um, so yeah, I think that rights of nature is a, a specific area of work that is becoming a huge, um, having a huge impact globally in Colombia. I mean, there's been so much growth in that movement. Even the UN Secretary General at the end of last year said that earth jurisprudence or laws that are pertaining to philosophies of earth are the fastest growing environmental movement in the world. And rights of nature is a part of that. Right. I have other questions, but I think at this point, since we've gone past the half hour, I want to open it up for uh, some of the participants on the call to ask questions if you want. And when I call on you, you can unmute, but please stay mute otherwise. Um, and if no one asks a question right away, I'll just pose one of my other ones, which was something I mentioned to you before, Osprey, to comment on some of the non-solutions that are put forth by the industry that have actually convince some people, maybe they buy into one of these ideas and why they're just quickly say something about why they are problematic and not solutions. One is carbon capture, cap and trade, nuclear power plants, pipelines for natural gas explained as a transition fuel. Um, can you say anything about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important that we name 
what what we term false solutions. You know, the climate justice movement, you know, has an umbrella of what we are calling uh, false solutions because they're being uh, perpetuated and put forth by governments, by the fossil fuel industry, by financial institutions. And so um, one of the things that becomes the sticky areas is what is the solution? And so let's just look at carbon offsets. I mean, that this is constantly lauded as a way to move our way through the climate crisis. And when we're talking about, maybe people have heard of the term net zero and that we need to achieve net zero carbon emissions by such and such a date, 2030, 2050. A lot of that is based on things like uh, carbon capture, carbon offsets, and some of these things that you've named. And um, I think that what's very dangerous about them is that a lot of the times people don't know what they are. I've been with negotiators who don't even know really what we're talking about. They're just glad someone came up with a solution and a title of something and made a pledge about something. Um, but as an example with carbon offsets, basically the idea is that um, a company or um, a country or you know whatever entity can continue to pollute. So a fossil fuel company can continue to extract and pollute as long as they buy carbon offsets somewhere else at another forest or some other location. And what's very tragic about this is that it's it's definitely a shell game because those forests where their carbon offsets are claimed have, have already been sequestering carbon. They're not inventing any new offset by now buying them. It didn't change the physics of anything. Mm -hmm. And then they get to continue to pollute at source. And also, I think it's really remarkable that at the beginning of last year, Vera, which was one of this very big company that was supposed to be monitoring carbon offsets about how they're working, the success of them, how companies are using them, what corporations are doing with them. They showed, and you know, I put the statistic in my book, 90% of those carbon offsets were totally fake. They were fandom credits. So I could go on and on, but the, the point is, I think just to get to the essence of it, the problem with false solutions are they're basically industry's way of keeping business as usual, like carbon capture and sequestration actually has a product that is fossil fuels. And it's it, in, 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 as you move forward in the process, um, carbon offsets, as I just explained, don't stop pollution at the source. They put them somewhere else. That doesn't work. Um, net zero is just a fancy way of also doing fancy accounting where you'd actually get to something that we call real zero, meaning really reducing carbon emissions. And we wrote a whole paper on it and I can share that with, with your group if you'd like with the yes, difference between do. net zero and real zero. But I'll, I'll just stop there. It's basically greenwashing in the sense of how do we keep doing extraction of fossil fuels and doing business as usual and kicking the can down the road. Very, very well put, very succinct. So Jerry has a question, go ahead. Um, first of all, just thank you for this presentation. I've been very immersed in climate as well. And you might remember that I was with you when we went with Georgia to talk to Jacobson years ago. Um, everything you said is exactly what I've been thinking especially the carbon, what you just said about carbon offsets. Um, a couple things. Are you familiar with Aviva Chomsky's book, uh, Is Science Enough? No. Okay. Um, it's something you, you might look at. It's a really good analysis in support of uh, mm -hmm. degrowth, which is basically one way of talking about, uh, you know, uh, an alternative economic structure. And the, the other thing I would ask is how do you have any um, recommendations for ways that we right here can get engaged in the kind of work that you are doing? Uh, well, thank you for that. And I also wanted just to mention another author who I've really loved. I don't know if any of you have been looking at his work also on degrowth or beyond growth is Jason Hickel. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it just he's he's amazing, a really, really powerful economist. Um, so I just wanted to mention him. I also um, did a lot of research on him for my book. And he's, I think, one of the most prominent economists right now for time to address the climate crisis and unpacking some of the issues that we've talked about today. 
And then in terms of, you know, how to get involved, I mean, I think that, um, you know, everyone is welcome to, to go to uh, www.wecaninternational.org, which is our organization, sign on to our newsletter, and we're always doing actions. I mean, you know, we're having a kind of a, a deep systemic talk today because we're talking about my book and sort of looking at the big picture. And I think it's very important to combine, you know, these deep analyses and deep thinking pieces along with then translating that, what does that look like on a practical level in action? So a lot of the things that you'll see at Weekend are, are you know, we're fighting this pipeline, you know, we're doing a project over here or doing a rights of nature event. So, you know, like a lot of it is very much hands-on, on the ground advocacy and projects. So there's lots always to do. So if you want to plug in, that's one thing to do. But I also really encourage people, I think a key to this, because we are, you know, um, we are in, a marathon, not a sprint, is it's just so important to do the things that we're really passionate about. There's just so much to do. And I kind of view it like a big ecosystem where wherever you plug in that you're passionate about, it's going to be needed. And when you do it from something you're passionate about, you can hang in there for the long haul that this is going to take to, to get us from where we are now to, to the world we know is possible. Like there's there's a trajectory here and we have to go through that process and we all need to engage, but we need to do it in a way that we're passionate about so we can do it for the long haul. And, and here you have this beautiful community with Georgia, you know, and, and the community that we build and who we're going on this journey with also matters because we can't do it alone. So how do we work together collectively and find the groups that we resonate with? Um, I think that's always the best way to go. Right. Thank you for that. Uh, Fran, uh, Corton, I see your hand up. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate how you're looking at the big picture, uh, Osprey. And um, of course, you're bringing out a lot of things that we don't want, uh, offsets or nuclear power or um, fault solutions, GDP growth. You're also implementing some positive initiatives, like you mentioned in, in uh, the Congo. And I'm wondering if, as you think about the big picture and the society that you want, whether you have a name for that society, what would we call the direction, the, the way we want to have this come out uh, at some future time? Do you have a name for that? I, I love that question. Um, so... It's interesting. I think I'll come at it from a couple of angles. One, you know, I'm I often talk about a healthy and equitable world. So what is a healthy and equitable world is sort of where I seem to be aiming things like what what is healthy for individuals, what's healthy for the ecosystem and what's equitable. And so that's one framing, you know, a health healthy and just future, a healthy and equitable future. Mm -hmm. Um I am, you know, of course, very familiar with the term with the um, ecological civilization that a lot of people are referring to as as a framing. What's an ecological civilization? Um, I also like the terms coming out of the global south of living, you know, with Wen Vivir or Sumat Kalsai, which is this idea of well living and a society based on Buen Vivir, which is um, really a sort of a response to to development but thinking about it quite differently in the ice, in the sense of growth in creativity, growth in well-being, growth in relationships, and how can we look at growth in a very different way than just material, endless economic growth. So I like this idea of Buen Vivir, Sumat Kalsai, and these ideas about being in the web of life and what our role is um, in, in the web of life, or like I said, a healthy and just society. Um, so, the reason I wanted to sort of mention a few is that I'm not yet convinced that we should have one. I'm not so convinced that this is the direction to go. So of course, you know, we do in our movements talk about ecological civilization, you know, it's a, it's a landing point, but I also have, you know, studied a lot with, you know, land-based people, indigenous peoples, and I see how, you know, more, you know, be, before the industrial revolution, before we became so um, modernized, you know, people did have more locally based community governance 
more locally based food sheds, watersheds, energy systems, which is the direction I think we need to go is localized, localized, localized. And then of course, spaces for global interaction. I'm not against global interaction or sharing of ideas whatsoever, but like in terms of our base, living locally and making that work for us. And so I'm not sure, I'm not convinced yet it should have one name because I see like even different tribes that lived, you know, one mountain range over had a, their own dialect and their own ceremonies, their own traditions. And so I, I'm not sure we need one naming, but rather an impulse to be life enhancing species, to once again be humans that live in harmony with the natural world within context to our ecological and cultural communities. Yeah, this is something, bringing this up is, I could open a can of worms really because, um, yeah, I, I thought a lot of things while you were saying this because maybe it's not us up to us as white people to name it, and and I think that's what you're saying basically that maybe it's too soon to have a name for it. We might have little tags that help us describe what we're talking about, but as as far as a name for the whole thing, maybe this is not the time to do that. History will do it for us. Maybe um, Ned has his hand up. Well, well, thank you for this, and Oriel, I look forward to reading your book, because I haven't read it yet, but now I must. <laughs> and, and one of the books I've read, of course, I still go back to my friend Thomas Berry, who says he puts a name on, on the next era. He calls it the Echozoic Era, when humans become mutually beneficial to all of life, which is the, the efforts you're talking about, being beneficial to the life in their communities, which is so beautiful to hear about. Anyway, my little struggle here in Sonoma County is working with our cities here. We talk about net zero emissions, like all excited about going to net zero. But when you look behind the print, they're talking about reducing to zero at best, just what's called their direct emissions from local consumption of fossil fuels. We're not talking about the fossil fuels we've caused to be consumed everywhere else in the world because of all, you know, our, our endless consumerism, buying stuff that's made all over the place and then shipped here on ships that have no regulations and on and on and on. Um, so I'm not sure what to do about this. I, I talk about it and I try to be gentle, but it just, it's on deaf ears. No one wants to hear any of this stuff about the actual impact that we are responsible for creating that's global in scale now, I mean, Americans, because of this endless growth society. And you hear on the TV shows, we're still like talking about how fantastic our GDP is and so forth. And that's why we're such a great country. Well, you know, some of us can see it in another way. That's really quite harmful. But uh, anyway, I, I'm going to stop there, but any thoughts you have in reaction would be, I'd be grateful to hear. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. So now, trying to kind of tease out a question um, in there. Um, <laughs> is, um, Part of it might be dealing with the difference between net zero and real zero. Yes, thank you. Yeah, no, no. And I, I, I appreciate your comments. I was just trying to like, you know, try to respond the best way I could. Um, I think some of this, uh, you know, when I, when you were talking at what I, what came to mind is a couple of things. One is that, um, while indeed we as individuals and as communities really need to think about reducing our carbon footprint, absolutely. There's no question whatsoever that, you know, we know the source of the climate crisis, which is, you know, emissions in the atmosphere. So there's no you know, question about the science behind that, but how do we take responsibility for that? So there's our personal lives, our personal footprint, our community, um, but in no way I, do I think those things need to happen separate from the fact that we also need to engage in the main actors. So um, mm. I do think it is about my personal lifestyle. I think we need to really personalize it and our community. But at the same time, I'm well aware that we have a fossil fuel industry that is interfering with a lot of change that we wanna make. Mm -hmm. In other words, um, you know, it's the fossil fuel industry that is continuing to, to 
push forward an agenda of business as usual. Um, there's even uh, been instances where because of trade deals between countries on how much fossil fuel extraction should be, you know, fossil fuels rather should be traded back and forth, that they have actually interfered with some projects around uh, renewable energy and sustainable renewable energy because it might interfere with that trade deal. Mm -hmm. All that to say that we also need to understand that the heads of these companies are not going to back down on their own. We're going to have to demand it and we're going to have to create other markets away from the fossil fuel industry. And we can't just sort of be, okay, if I just, you know, stop, I'll, you know, just stop using my dryer and hang up my clothes outside and I don't fly, that that is going to do enough. It's important. I completely believe in individual action and the integrity of our own lives and how we take responsibility for that. But at the same time, you know, the U.S. military is the biggest fossil fuel emitter, uh, fo carbon emissions emitter in the world. OK, so like we need to deal also with militarism and the role of militarism in fueling the climate crisis while we deal with the fossil fuel industry. And what are they doing at the climate talks as, as uh, uh, um, Georgia was bringing up earlier? So I think we need to have a like this very layered approach, which is very personal at a community level, but also we collectively need to engage in these industries and demand from our governments to get some regulation going on here and that we get our economy off of fossil fuels. And I'll just say one last thing and then I'll hand it back to you, Georgia, which is that um, I also am very honored to sit on something called the Fossil Fuel Nonproliferation Treaty, mm -hmm. which was um, uh, chairs, it has been chaired by a wonderful woman named Zipporah Berman. And um, basically, we know that we have the Paris Climate Agreement, which, as I mentioned earlier, has its function in place. It's, it's insufficient to deal with the crisis at hand. Uh, but there is this other mechanism that can work in parallel and support and complement the Paris Climate Agreement, which is this fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, which is actually really gaining momentum, which is a mechanism where countries can come together and explicitly talk about uh, coal, oil, and gas, and getting off of fossil fuels. And there's over 11 countries that have now endorsed this treaty. And very excitingly, when we were at the COP in Dubai, again, these are some things that you don't hear about on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. There was a really powerful event um, in which um, Colombia, uh, the president of Colombia, made the announcement at uh, the last COP that they would endorse the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, which is really big because Colombia is a fossil fuel producing country. And so uh, this is just another way of suggesting in response to your question that I think it's a lot about understanding, you know, what we do at a local level, but also understanding there's these big forces at hand that we're going to have to collectively keep pushing on to get some results um, to go in the direction we want to stop things like false solutions false ideas about net zero that are just greenwashed and get to really getting off of fossil fuels. So I would just sort of knit all those things together. Thanks so much. Yeah, and uh, the other thing I wanted to bring in just before I call on Jerry again is how war is one of the biggest polluters. And you're talking about the military, how, how much of our money goes toward it, but how much fossil fuel is used, that the, they're the biggest polluters in the world. And I think how important it is that the peace movement is relevant to this environmental movement because all the wars that we support and help generate around the world are causing unbelievable amount of destruction to the climate more than any of us are doing individually as a whole group i mean it's it's huge and people don't tend to associate war with the climate crisis but we need to put these together so jerry jerry did you want to yes ask? i just want maybe um, yeah, to, to follow up with what Ned was saying, um, it's not just what we consume. Our local economy is a disaster for the climate. This wine industry that's um, destroyed tens of thousands of acres of trees for vineyard development to create a product that's distributed around the world, talking about, uh, you know, emissions from uh from air travel uh air freight uh, maritime freight and the tourist industry 
I mean, our local economy is an absolute disaster. And in uh, 2017, I prevailed in court against the county's climate action plan because they didn't even account for any of these, uh, you know, what, what's called transboundary emissions. So, and somehow it's like fish not being aware of the water they're swimming in or something. I mean, people just don't even talk about that. But, you know, we're as bad as, uh, you know, an economy that's based on oil production, really. So um, just to... And, we're not going to end with your sour note, Jerry. But... Excuse me? <laughs> well, it's not a sour note. It's just a matter of being... Yeah, we know it's true. ...aware of what's happening. And um, one thing I'm doing now is I'm... A, uh, as a result of that lawsuit, I was, I was invited to become a member of the Sierra Club State Committee on Energy and Climate, and I'm sort of there... Uh, resident expert on climate action plans, and I'm advising them on putting out a set of guidelines for communities dealing exactly with issues like carbon offsets and uh, scope of the of their greenhouse gas inventories, et cetera. Yeah, so, you and Ned, anyway, Ned, you and Ned need to talk. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I don't know if you know each other, but but I'll make that introduction if not. Okay, well, we yeah. know each other from this, from being on these talks, for sure. Yeah, Ned is in Petaluma. Yeah, I know. Um, does anyone else have a last, well, I think we're just about end, so I don't know if anyone has a short question or a short answer. Uh, maybe not. Kimberly's raising her hand, raising, raising, oh, Kimberly? raising. Kimberly, okay, I didn't see you. Kimberly, go ahead. Yep. Oh, Spree, thank you. This has really been fantastic. And I do look forward to reading your book. Um, I don't know if you can actually answer this quickly, but uh, how do you use your economic analysis to really talk about specifically um, about the uh, rainforest in the Amazon? Because every single thing that I read about land use and climate change, it's the very first thing that comes up. And they all talk about that all the endeavors have hardly made any change at all in terms of deforestation. So where do you see that going? And if that we had some sort of a group to support, what would that be? Or where should our voice really be elevated? Yeah, the 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 situation around forests is uh, you know very very dire, as you say. You know, the Amazon rainforest is at a tipping point right now, and uh, you know the Congo Basin, the Indonesian forests, the boreal forests all have different challenges. Whether it's the actual change in climate and the ecological impacts on the forests, or um, you know the the fact of extraction and ongoing extraction, whether that's for for mining or wood or for oil, that is often under the ground of these forests, um, or the palm oil, in the case of Indonesia. Um, so there's a direct relationship between our consumer society and the protection of these forests. Um, since you had mentioned the economy and how does this relate to the economy, um, I, I think it's very difficult for us to save these forests in the long run if we don't change our consumer habits, because that's what's causing the extraction to continue this endless economic growth model and this endless consumption, which we have to stop. And it's mostly the wealthy countries and the global north that have to address this. This is where uh, we're, we're, we're experiencing uh, the most harm taking place. Um, and um, so it's, 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 it's a whole cultural shift away from consumerism that is a part of the solution. And then also there's a lot of debt in the Global South countries because of the way that, that our world is set up right now due to colonization and capitalism that also causes the Global South where like as an example, the Amazon is or the DR Congo where those countries um, are you know, subjected to systems that put them into debt that then require them to continue to mine or um, uh, uh, pull fossil fuels out of the ground that harm the forests um, because of the uh, financial wreckage that our current systems um, really deploy in their countries. And so this is why I say we have to really look at this as a systemic level 
and realize, you know, what is our role here in the United States as a wealthy country to the rest of the world? And what are our policies and how do we really stop deforestation? Um, how do we stop the extraction in these lands? And some of it has to do with um, really dealing with debt in other countries. Some of it has to do with lessening our um, consumer habits. And some of it has to do also just with the fact of a worldview shift around our role with nature and one another, which is why, you know, I, I kind of approached from a worldview perspective, because, you know, it also depends on who's leading these countries. Um, you know, like Lula has been in office in Brazil and has, a lot of the forest has been protected more than it has been in years under the Bolsonaro regime. So it also depends on the agenda of countries that, you know, have, um, you know, um, primary forests and, and, and how we regulate them. So I, I, there's so much there. I don't want to, you know, I know we're at the end, so I don't want to say too much more, but I think a lot of it has to do with the different components I'm addressing here. It's not going to just happen through, you know, one, one venue uh, of, of addressing the protection of forests. All right. Which could lead to a lot of other questions. I, I noticed that Fran and David, you have your hand up. We, we could do one short question and then we have to finish. Fran? Yeah, Osprey, I just wanted to jump in before we end to, to say how much I appreciate everything you're doing. I, I haven't heard you say anything that I would in any way question or change the analysis. It's, it's just extraordinary. And the work you're doing is, is off the chart. So just thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, thank you. You're bringing tears to my eyes, David. That was very, very, very heartfelt. And coming from you, someone who I deeply respect, it, it means a lot. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll take that into my heart. And thank you for your very generous words. And you're incredible. You know, both you and Fran have been amazing leaders in our movement. I just want to take a chance to also say thank you to both of you and how honored I am to, to sit in this space with both of you. Thank you. And I feel the same way with both of you as well, and with you, Osprey. It's been a wonderful meeting today, really deep and rich with ideas and thinking and action. So thank you so much, Osprey, for being with us. I'm going to st uh, stop the recording if you have any last things to say before I stop the recording. Just what an honor it is to be with you, and thank you for you know having this time for deeper conversations so we're not in our soundbite world where we can actually really have a conversation Thank you for that. Thank you, Osprey.